Uh, to talk about it all now from somewhere on uh, the roads of Ashburn or perhaps his house down the road, uh, it is my co-host for the Take a Man podcast, uh, my good friend, Logan Paulson. Uh, Logan, uh, busy day. Uh, I know you got to talk to Dan Quinn uh, on, on something you guys taped for the Commander's YouTube page. You've obviously known Dan a long time. What was it like to, to see your guy today and, uh, and, and what did you take out of the press conference and the conversation? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it was just it kind of took me back to when I was playing. Honestly, just uh, the the way he speaks, the passion with he speaks, wish the vision that he has for the team and the organization, um, it got me kind of feeling like I wanted to put the pads on again, you know, and do some stuff. Oh um, man, you know, you, you can't say that. You're gonna have people begging you to be the third tight end and start blocking people again. You 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 know no, when no, you no, say I, stuff I, like that, people are gonna yeah. jump on that. <laughs> I know, but I'm more speaking. Yeah, I, I can't physically do it anymore. I want to, but I can't physically do it anymore. Um, but yeah, so like I think that was something that stuck out to me. Just his vision. I love like, I loved his awareness of like kind of the the pitfalls that came out of Atlanta. You know, understanding that he had stretched himself too thin, saying, you know, that's why I came here. We've got Adam for the personnel. I can be in my lane. He even said, I brought these coordinators in because I have faith in them to execute their visions of the offense and the defense, and I can oversee and build this culture and build the team the way that it needs and it deserves to be built. And, again, like just a guy that I have the utmost respect for, you could you could feel his passion. You could feel the fact that he had constantly been learning, uh, you know, during his time as the coordinator in Dallas, which, again, I think is just so special and speaks to the type of person that he is. So I'm incredibly fired up. I know Fletch was really fired up. I got to watch the press conference with him, Santana, and, and Fred, and they were all just – you know, ecstatic. And I think you can feel that energy from him and all the players that I've talked to can feel that, you know, so uh, I'm really, really excited and uh, I can't wait for the team to kind of meet him officially. And uh, I think they're going to just be super impressed with him. What is that process like, by the way? Um, that, that is one thing I noticed today. There weren't any players at the press conference. Um, I remember when Rivera was hired that there was, you know, Adrian Peterson was there. John Allen was there. Uh, you know, we've seen like Terry was there famously at the EV press conference last year. And part of that is just timing of when guys are in and out of town. So no one should take uh, that mere pointing out of facts and say like, oh my God, these players, uh, they don't, you know, nobody, nobody was there to support Dan Quinn. What does it mean? It, it probably just means they're on vacation um, or, or whatever it may be. But like, what is that process like? And what are the rules this time of year on players being able to actually talk to Dan Quinn? And, and when will that those meetings really happen? Yeah, you know, I think if they wanted to, they could have come by. Obviously, like you said, like it's more of a, this is the off season. People are not around here. They're on vacation. They're working out someplace else. They're they're doing, they're, they have appointments, they have lives. You know, this is kind of a last minute press conference scheduling. And us, you know, media members, we're excited to go because this is our job, you know, to kind of go have these conversations. But I think, yeah, just players run around. And I think Dan will probably start reaching out to people, like calling people on the phone. I remember, uh, you know, this never happened to me specifically because I wasn't like a big name or a captain on the team, but I'd have conversations with guys after a new coach came in. He's like, oh, yeah, I talked to, you know, Jay for 15 minutes on the phone call the other day. And, I got a feel for like what, you know, he just was telling me how excited he was or whatever. And I think something like that will probably happen. I mean, I just feel like there's so much going on. This process has happened so quickly. Um, but I know Dan and I know his priorities are the guys and are the players. So, you know, I think that's going to be a priority for him is to, to reach out at some point or, or you know, uh, you know, just have the, that open that line of communication and kind of just show what kind of coach he is as soon as and as early in the process as he possibly can. Yeah, and as he mentioned, uh, kind of at the end of the presser, like there are rules that it was funny because he he had kind of a uh, he misstated what he meant to say, which is you know which, rules which allow or disallow certain communication. Um, but he said that rules uh, he went like can be ignored or not, and I was like, no, that's not how that works. You if there are rules, Dan, you have to follow them. Uh, but there there are very right. specific things you are and are allowed to talk about uh, at this time in the calendar. Um, so that sure. real introduction will happen. I I think like April when they get together. Uh, you know. For their first mini camp or whatever it may be uh you know when you hire a new coach you get uh newer or you get like that new coach window of, of camps and stuff so they'll do all that kind of sure. stuff later in the calendar um i know a lot of people listening want to hear your opinion on cliff kingsbury um we, you know we've been talking about dan as a prospect and then uh yeah, obviously the reality of dan being the head coach uh on the podcast before but cliff kingsbury is someone who's new to the commander's universe i know you were watching a little bit of tape last night as all happened very quickly but what are your early impressions on cliff kingsbury as an offensive coordinator in 2024 in the nfl and especially for this team 
Yeah, I, you know, I think I, you know, I was a little bit reluctant, you know, because he's got this reputation of kind of being a college guy, air quotes, and you know, does he really understand that, like, you know, the air raid? There's a reason the air raid doesn't work in the NFL. Like, the hashes are closer, guys are faster. And I think the thing that happened when I turned on the film, I watched three games from 2021 just to kind of get a feel for the offense and a feel for the concepts. As I saw an, an offense that is kind of has its lineage in college football, you know, they've got wide splits. They've got these wide bunches. They try to create all this space horizontally, which I think Dan did a good job of articulating in his press conference. And that does present problems for defenses. But the thing that I was really excited about is I felt like there were some creative ways of getting to that stuff. Hey, you know, we're going to run this, um, you know, three by one RPO 10 times in this game. Can we get to it five different ways? And I thought they did a good job, at least in the games that I watched of doing that. I also thought he understood how to manipulate linebackers. Like there was a beautiful play action in the second game week nine against the San Francisco 49ers, where they run like a single back power action from gun. They fake a bubble screen and they throw what essentially amounts to a drift in the hole that's vacated by the linebacker matching the pull in guard. And the, uh, and the, and the nickels kind of attached to this like little smoke route. And I thought, you know, like this is a different way of getting to it, but this is essentially what Kyle Shanahan does is he understands how to manipulate secondaries with spacing, with splits, with run action, with backfield action. And I, I you know, again, I came out of it relatively surprised, pleasantly surprised that there was that level of detail and level of nuance to the passing game. And again, the run game is, is somewhat you know, compared to the Detroit to the world, compared to San Francisco, relatively simplistic. But I do think that there is a an understanding of what's important in the run game. Hey, we got to create angles for this guy. So in the first game against San Francisco week five in 2021, they're running a lot of counters. And because of how they've aligned their receivers and they've allocated their eligibles, they create good angles. So I'm like, you know, we don't have – you know, uh, you know, receivers going in and cracking linebackers like they do in San Fran, but we've done a good job of creating horizontal displacement in the defense and by extension creating line, uh, you know, um, uh, angles to the second level for the offensive line. So I, I did come out of the film study and, you know, conversations I've had with, uh, you know, guys that have played from around the league and kind of saying, you know, I do think that there's more innovation here than people want to give him credit for. And I do think there's a willingness to run the football uh, more of a willingness than people want to give him credit for. It, it's just going to look a little different and feel a little different than some of the other um, systems that you see around the NFL at the moment that are, you know, obviously the Kyle Shanahan tree and, and the Ben Johnsons of the world. But I do think that there is something there, which, again, got me kind of excited and saying, wow, this guy knows football and he, know, and he understands kind of the basics, which is manip- manipulating space and finding easy opportunities for the quarterback and then knowing and having a really good feel as a play caller, I thought, for when and where to take shots. So lots of positive things to take away from. Is it going to look different than, you know, maybe I think a lot of fans wanted it to look? Yeah, but it's still effective. I think so. Uh, Logan Paulson, of course, my co-host on Take Command uh, with us here on the Hoffman Show. Uh, We'll talk more later in the week on Take Command about Logan's trip to the Senior Bowl last week. Crazy because, you know, this draft is so important and we've spent so much time on it already. Uh, And then all this stuff happens and you were in Mobile and then it's like, Hey guys, uh, do you guys ever want to do the, the Senior Bowl debrief podcast? We will <laughs> later in the week. Uh, everyone, everyone, stay patient. Right now, though, all eyes on the press conference today and the coordinator hiring. So here to combine those two, Logan, my big takeaway offensively from the press conference today, and wh- the moment where I went, oh, that's why he hired Cliff Kingsbury, is he talked about the one of the words that he wants to have uh, describe this football team as explosive. And that's going to involve right. like vertical shots down the field. And then when he was asked about the current roster, he's like, you know, I love the interior, the D line. We need to build up the lines. Interior is really important offensively and defensively. And the receiver position is really important too. I like those guys. They create matchups. Like we can, we need to to use those uh, that really well. And I, and I think about like the problems last year offensively, and uh, especially I think of Terry's frustration, where you know he straight up in post game press conferences was like, "We need to throw the football down the field more. Like just give me a chance." Yeah. And to me. If I'm Dan Quinn and I've got a guy like Terry who's great contested catch, you know, four three speed and is not being used vertically. And, you know, I, I look at this draft and there's a bunch of big X receivers.
receivers and uh, guys that can get down the field. You have Jahan Dotson, who's another 4-3 guy. Deami Brown is under contract, another 4-3 guy. Like the ability to get the ball down the field and them not doing it the last couple of years has been so mystifying. And you know, if nothing else, while all the other stuff you said about Cliff in the run game and Cliff doing this and Cliff doing that are true, Cliff Kingsbury is going to sling the football down the field. Like there's going to be some deep yeah. shots available. So to me, that's where that all came together. And I'm curious uh, in the film study and, and kind of what you've been hearing around the league, like that vertical element uh, to the passing game and how it fits with some of the personnel that's here. And and if that ties to any of the the top quarterbacks in this draft and, and their skill sets. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you bring up a great point. There's certain guys, like certain offensive play callers, and you can tell what, like, their home base is, like where they feel really comfortable. Like, if they're kind of in a little bit of a rut, like, what's the call they're going to? So, like, the classic Bill Callahan example is he's running 12 or 13 duo. Like, that's like, like that's home base for him. That's where he feels most secure. And you can tell Cliff feels most secure in, in the gun. We're spread out. We've got one back in the backfield, and we've got four wide outs, and we are trying to get down the field, you know, in a drop-back passing scenario. So don't get it twisted. Like, his offense has evolved and he's changed, but at his core, like, he is a pass game guy who wants to be innovative in that space. So I definitely agree. I think, I think the one thing that Dan said, which I think is really important to kind of hear for football fans at home, is this idea that, A, uh, Cliff, under, Cliff in his offense understands how to create space because you got, you know, space players. You want to maximize their opportunities. You mentioned Terry. You mentioned Jahan. Obviously, De'Ami Brown under contract, right? But I think that's one thing. And then also just defenses that give him a hard time. And that's oftentimes, like you see, like Kyle finds um, offense or finds defensive structures that give him a hard time, and he hires that defensive staff. I think when I remember when I was in San Francisco and we were prepping for games um, in, in, the, in the division, I talked to the defensive coordinator, Saul, and I was like, what's the hardest defense in the division to prep for? And he's like, by far, Arizona. Because of what they do, they go hurry up, they have these wide bunches, they get these guys out there quick, they've got the quarterback that can run. And I just thought, like, he just basically found something that gives defensive coordinators a really hard time and said, I want that here with me. Because I do think when you watch it, like you said, like, you know, he does all this innovative stuff, creating space, wants to push the football down the field. But I think the core tenant of the value add here from Cliff is understanding space and understanding space players and understanding how to get them the ball in those spaces. So I think that's something that I think is really going to be exciting to watch from a football innovation standpoint is how does Cliff get to those, uh, get to the, get to that space with the players that we have here in Washington and maximize those skill sets. So that brings us to, uh, I would say both forward to and back to the quarterback discussion because he had Kyler in Arizona that he was building around and you know, he's in gun all the time. Uh, Cliff, you know, offensively was in gun basically all the time. I wonder how much that that had to do with Kyler, where he did use pistol um, quite a bit, and that was kind of his solution to take away some of the deficiencies of being in gun all the time. You know, we talked that last year about how gun runs are ninety percent of the time going to opposite the side of the back, and and some of the other things yeah. angle wise that are really limiting from the gun. And, and I think you did a good job earlier of explaining how Cliff uh, does deal with some of that from the angle standpoint, but you know, the pistol can be really, really helpful in dealing with some of those yeah. deficiencies, but also like you're not putting Kyler Murray under center. He's too small. And so I do right. wonder if, you know, a Jaden Daniels, a Caleb Williams average or bigger than average size quarterbacks, obviously Drake may is, is a, you know, he's a prototypical size quarterback. Like I, I wonder, does this system have the ability to go under center and could that then even plug some more holes in it where some of the play action stuff becomes a bigger part and some of these things that would seem to be the next evolution for a Kingsbury offense if he chooses to go there? No, I think that's, that's a really good question. And I do think one of the things that I came out of the film study is basically saying this guy understands some of this offense's limitations and has grown the offense. And so I do think that's one thing that gets me kind of excited in addition to some other things, right? Obviously there's reservations, but in terms of excitement, like one of the things that sticks out to me is like he's able to kind of tailor make positions and opportunities four guys like he understands talent like Dan Quinn in his press conference talked about how it's his job as a coach to find what the player does well and then you know maximize that in the context of the defense and I felt like there were shades of that with Cliff right hey we got DeAndre Hopkins he's a great contested catch guy let's give him these opportunities you know um, you know we've got Rondell Moore there who did 
who is a great satellite space player, let's get him those touches in satellite space opportunities. And I just and like here's Zach Ertz, a guy that can attack the seam with the best of them, maybe a Hall of Famer. Let's find a way to maximize those guys. And, you know, there were times, honestly, where Kyler's under center in that offense. And, again, like you said, you wouldn't think that's something you would do because he is so small. But he used that tool to help maximize the offense for the rest of the playmakers, right? They Obviously, Ty, Kyler's a prolific runner. They found ways to get him in the design quarterback run game, again, to maximize what they do offensively. So I just think there's a lot there in terms of him being somewhat flexible not married totally to his scheme, because I think that's really what you're hiring here is a guy that has offensive foresight and offensive and an offensive innovation in his blood. And so that was kind of cool to see from that 2021 tape is just a guy who's willing to say, hey, I don't have all the answers. Like, let's see if I can find some different opportunities to put these guys in better positions to be successful. So that made me feel better about all three of those guys you mentioned. You know, like the the offense can somewhat be tailor-made and kind of fit to fit the skill sets of the guy's at the top of this draft. So, you know, if there is an opportunity to take one of those guys, I think he's going to he's gonna help maximize those guys. And I don't think it's a coincidence that he's got a history of, of helping quarterbacks develop because he understands, you know, I w- understands when to take shots, when to deleverage the position. Now, that deleveraging looks a little bit different, but he understands that at a high level, and I think he can maximize all three of those guys. Logan Paulson with us here on the Hoffman Show. Of course, the Take Command podcast, your off-season home for everything Commanders. Logan and I giving that to you twice a week. Uh, Although some people, Logan, will be hearing this not as we are right now because we're going to take this interview and put it in the Take Command feed uh, as soon as we're done talking. Uh, So if you're listening to it there, thanks for subscribing. Uh, All right. uh, You mentioned there are reservations, uh, and I certainly share some of those, and and you probably have some more detail on some of them with you. I mean, the obvious ones from, from the highest of levels is they collapsed in Arizona at the end of every single season that he was there. There were some good seasons, some middling seasons, and some bad seasons, but the one thing that was consistent was bad Decembers for Kyler Murray and and bad Decembers for the Arizona Cardinals. And frankly, that was very similar to the results he would have at Texas Tech. They would start hot uh, when he was in Lubbock, and then things would go sideways by the end, and that ultimately is why uh, his alma mater says thank you very much after, what was it, five, six years of him being there. And, And I think some of that has to do with the tempo and you know teams kind of figure it out. He's not able to make that second, third adjustment throughout the season. What are the reservations, the things that you know he needs to, to look at to ensure that uh, both that late season uh, decline doesn't happen and, and any other issues and reservations you may have with Kingsbury uh, coming here as the OC? Yeah, so I think one of the things that sticks out to, about Cliff and that offense is again, like I, I've been, I was really impressed with that 2021 film study. I was like, man, this guy knows ball at a high level. You can tell he's more comfortable as a pass game coordinator. Like the the runs that he runs are somewhat limited. There's not a lot of diversity there, um, and the protection scheme up front is is a little bit simplistic. And it makes me think back to some stuff that Scott Turner did, some stuff that EB did. That again, if you live too much in those worlds, and again, he wants to live in those worlds because he's very comfortable with them. But at some point, people are going to be able to exploit them. I don't think there's a coincidence that the teams that are in the Super Bowl have very complex run schemes, very complex protection schemes, very good play action systems, right? Because it just gives defenses more stuff to have to deal with and have to negotiate. So I, I, that is my one reservation. Now, I think he's a bright guy. Like when you talk to people about him, he's a very bright guy and he's a guy that understands football at the highest level. It's just about embracing this other element saying, you know, like, and you can see that he's done, he's taken steps to get that done. But that's one thing where I'm like, I kind of wring my hands a little bit. Like, are you prolific enough in these areas to, to make the offense comp- complicated enough for long enough into the season. And we'll see. We'll, we'll see what that looks like. But, again, I think he's a guy that's shown a, a willingness to change, a willingness to grow, and a willingness to innovate. It's just about making sure that he continues to push himself in those kind of, you know, that offensive line world of how do we make the protections work? How do we make the run scheme work at a high level? And, again, you see that on film, and it makes sense. He's an air raid guy. Like, he wants to throw the football. But to win games in the NFL – you need to be able to do both at a high level. So that that's my one reservation is, is how has he grown in his kind of time at USC, his year away from the NFL? How has he kind of changed his process? Because, you know, Dan talked about all his, his growth and self-analytics during his time in Dallas to get him back to this head coaching role. Hopefully, um, hopefully uh, um, he has done the same thing from a coordinator perspective and said, man, these are some areas where I've had a little bit of a blind spot. Hopefully I can improve. 
Uh, defensively, uh, we now know that Quinn will not call the plays. Um, I think we talked about it on the podcast last week after hearing KJ Wright talk about it. You kind of wish that he would, or I kind of wish that he would because he's so good at it. But, uh, Joe Witt has been right there with him. Uh, seems like a very capable lieutenant. Uh, we'll see if he can step up a level and, and be that play caller. And he's obviously going to have a lot of, of input from Dan on all of this. But I did, uh, think it was interesting that Quinn identified that interior of the defensive line as a part of the, the roster that he really really likes um obviously if adam peters is like hey dude we got a great trade uh offer for john allen in two weeks from now um that could change but john did say uh at our event on friday night where he was a special guest that he had a great discussion with peters and he feels really good about it so it does seem like he wants to stay he's not going to demand a trade um all all that wind up to to ask logan like when you look at the pieces here for the the defense that now we know dan quinn is going to run with joe witt what are what are the things that you think fit? What are the things that you're excited about? What are the things where you're like they gotta they gotta do something else there because it doesn't fit schematically with what Dan wants to do? Well, I'm just really ex- honestly, I'm just ecstatic that they are going to have guys a, a guy in Dan and Wit that understands how to maximize secondary play. I think that's really what I'm looking forward to because like when you watch Dallas, one of the things that sticks out is like a they understand that. Their coverage is tied to the rush. It allows them to be very aggressive. It'll be interesting to see if that changes during the time here because, they, you know, as, as of the, this moment, they don't have that elite edge rusher. They've got two guys inside that are very dynamic. But does that change their approach? Um, obviously, I think disguising coverages and then giving them rules and responsibilities for specific situations is something that I think I'm really looking forward to see. So I think, you know, we came out of last year saying, man, you know, we're not very good at the secondary here in Washington. But I really believe that with the right coaching and the right level of communication, you've got some pieces here that, you know, might not be the answer for, you know, five years here, but I think can play better um, this in, in 2024 and 2025. So that's kind of my my optimism here going into this is that when you just look at that secondary play for Dallas, the way they disguise coverages, the way they communicate in the back end, the way they understand where their help is, I, I just think that group is going to get better. So I think all these pieces that people are kind of out on at the moment, I think people say, oh, they're going to be there. You know, they might not be the the greatest secondary of all time, but I think they're at least passable next year. I think the defense is significantly better as a result. I do too. I am fascinated to see what they do with Emmanuel Forbes because God, yeah, the play too. the playmakers that they've had in Dallas and the production they've gotten out of those guys, if they can they can get that out of Forbes with his ball skills and everything that he was supposed to be coming out. Uh, that could be one hell of a salvation project. Uh, Logan Paulson, uh, you can catch his interview with Dan Quinn on Command Center on the Commander's YouTube page. Uh, and of course, the Take Command podcast with me multiple times each and every week. Uh, our next pod will be later this week. Uh, I'll be out in Vegas. Uh, Logan will be uh, in, in his home where he normally records it. Uh, but that's that's okay. It'll still be a great podcast. And we're going to we're gonna rely on Logan, even though I'll be the one on location this week. We'll rely on Logan's travels last week, and we will recap what he saw down in Mobile at the Senior Bowl. So very much looking forward to that. Uh, Thank you, sir, for your time here on the radio show today, and I will talk to you later, my friend. Thanks, Craig. Look forward to it, buddy. Enjoy the rest of your show, bud. Thank you. Uh, Logan Paulson, everybody, slash that was the Take Command podcast, kind of, uh, here on the Hoffman Show. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.